have at me with questions. We've still got translation, I, I assume, so um, um, feel free to uh, speak in Spanish or, or Australian as you see fit. Yeah, I, I have a question for, uh, for Paul and Nicola. I think that when I, when I saw that grid, Cells, uh, you, it's like you're thinking that the, the fish underwater is a constant. You think that the fish moves a lot, so when you take a little cell from that grid, may, 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 I don't know, may pass one year without any fish. So you might think it could be some depredation, but there is not. There's just no fish. Yeah, um. Uh, what, uh, the catch rates might change over time, and it's, it's true, it, it is a bias. But what we know from the two fish, it doesn't move much. Some of the individuals move long distances, but 90% of the fish that we have tagged, they don't move more than 20 miles. Yeah, we were just talking with uh, Mart about that. Here we, we and uh, our professor from CEPES can, can agree with him that the, that the fish moves a lot from Argentina to Peru. Yeah, I'm talking about Jose and Kagan with the yeah, experience the, we have. No, no, not saying I just it's wanted all. to make that difference between your island mm. and our country. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I think one thing that you should consider when you look at CPE, for example, is that you need to, that's where you do the standardization of the CPE, so you need to um, take account these variables and make sure that the signal that you see is due to depredation and not due to fish moving away. So this is why, for example, tag data and understanding these movements is very important. In fact, the Falkland idea was, was a nice definition. If there is at least one piece of, piece of fish, that means there was a uh, depredator, was the depredation was there. So if you find a fish or just a leap of one fish, it means that the depredation was there. If, if there is a fish without any, any trials uh, tri of uh, or pieces of fish, there is other thing. Sorry, should I answer yeah. for that? Yeah. Okay. You can have a rejoinder. Yeah. Okay, so what I, um, I think it's important to understand that is that you don't always see a trace of depredation. Um, and this might be different in different fisheries, but in our, at least in our fishery we know that we, c we see signs of feeding and associated drops in CPUE without seeing things like lips left over on the, on the line. So um, where we work, the fish gets taken off quite cleanly off the hook. Um, but you can, so by having these observations, these very good observations on the behavior of the animals around, you can make the connection that these animals have been feeding on the line. I also, so this was something that, you know, there were some differences in, in the approach. So you were saying you only label a set as depredated if there's damaged fish seen versus what I think a, a, quite a few of us are not. It's, it's great if you have that evidence, but um, in our fishery as well, we appreciate that if there isn't damaged fish visible, that doesn't mean depredation didn't occur necessarily. Um, and at a minimum, it's, it's that then therefore means that you should really look at, try to compare sets where you have presence only, but no evidence of damaged fish, and then sets with presence and evidence of damaged fish. See if you see a change in the CPUE reduction associated there. And then you can kind of tease apart what's maybe the most valid approach for your fishery. So, um, but I think with these soft mouth fishes, we are seeing, I mean, and there's visual, there's proof that these whales are just taking the whole thing. So you need to look at more than just counting. What, counting fish, damaged fish is a really important component, but I think it's really important to look at also presence um, as, a, as a signal and, and compare the two, because you could get a pretty severe underestimate if you don't consider that. Uh, yes, yes, that's definitely right. As I pointed out in my presentation, we're sort of at the first step of doing this, and we now need to work more towards corroborating it with the observations that are taken uh, by, the, uh, by the vessel's own uh, ma fishing masters and so forth, and see how much correlation there is, and if we can improve that approach. 
But uh, as a first cut, uh, it's interesting to think that this is a method that can be implied, can be applied without ever looking at a whale at all. So it's a pure analytical method, which I simply can do on my computer and never have to worry about whether anyone saw a whale or not. So at, as a first level, it's interesting that it gave some significant results that way. interested in what um, uh, Nicholas had to say about the um, um, grenadier and I use that in my head uh, uh, a lot in um, South Georgia to estimate um, roughly how much I think I've lost in the way of toothfish off a line when I pulled it but it's only area specific it might be um, there are the three for example there's one area that we call Rat Gully we catch a lot of grenadier there so um, one line compared with the next line, the bycatch is normally similar. But after the whales come through, there's a big difference. So it's, it's not something that we record on a database or anything, but it's certainly a, a, a method that, that we use um, to estimate just how much we may have lost. So yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start. Get you on. Yes, uh, I heard uh, so one of you mentioned the duration time of the haul. Is uh, are you actually also measuring the hauling speed at all, like meters per uh, meters hauled per minute or hooks hauled per minute? Um, that's a question, and I also wanted to add. Uh, I've noticed the difference in hook the hooks used. I know in Alaska for the sablefish it's mostly circle hooks being used today and if I understand um, the tooth fishery right and the, the fishing vessels down here it's mostly J hooks is that correct? So I just wanted to point out that the choice of hook matters of uh, the likeliness of where the hook is going to be set, or the hookup is going to happen. With a <coughs> non-offset circle hook, you increase the chances of it being hooked all the way in the outer part of the lip. And while a J hook, uh, you increase the chances of, of hooking it further down in the mouth or even in the gut. And I would imagine that that also plays a role on the um, um, what's left on the hooks when uh, when you're pulling in the gear so yes yeah no, that makes sense yeah yep mm -hmm. i don't know if that one's yeah there it is on just to sort of piggyback on what john said um some factors that may affect whether there's a f you see a fish on the hook or not in our area sometimes the currents also very strong and so you're not even sure if your gear got to the bottom but the gear that did get on the bottom you might see fish grenadier and there may or may not be a whale around and certain times of year it's it's quite strong you almost can't get enough sash weights on there so you know there's there's multiple factors that really affect whether a fish come on so a, a proxy sometimes we use okay the bait came back depending what kind of bait you used and if there's depredation on the bait maybe from sand fleas or whatnot but so this is another another thing to think about. Yeah. So the set times in the Alaskan fishery they're a bit shorter than the toothfish as well. Is that the impression I got? Like they're sort of six hours or so. Or it, it, uh, in the sablefish fishery, it really you know there's areas where we know there's sand fleas, for instance, okay. and so you'll you know haul it back after six hours. There's places you can leave it out for 12 hours, and the fish are very much alive. There's nothing no sand fleas around, so it, it kind of does vary. Um, there's probably an average number, but it's really kind of site specific. Yeah, but I mean that'd be, a, that'd be yeah. a, 12 hours would be a pretty short soak, wouldn't it, for, for toothfish, yeah. Oh. So they're, they're down for quite a bit longer than that, usually. That's the other thing too, the survey has a standardized approach, which is great, because yep. then you know exactly what it's doing, but then fishermen are looking at something out there just trying to catch, you know, fish when they're out there for a not for a stock assessment purpose, so, you know, for their livelihood. 
use your use your speak uh, use the microphone, please, if you're going to talk. Sorry, uh, so everyone can hear. Often we'll have lines that are soaking for um, you know up to two days. I'll purposely we can purposely leave lines soaking for two days uh, as a normal practice. Well, four hours is the shortest, probably yep. possible. So, Andreas. Right, I just had a small question for Jeff. Uh, when you say that you look at whether the bait came back or not, um, is that something you're able to consistently record, or is it more like an anecdotal thing that you'll notice from time to time? Yeah, I think the second point, because um, there's other factors, whether the bait maybe stayed on there or not, um, yeah. it, it, kind of the bait type of bait used right. is, is one, one thing. W whether they forgot to unfreeze it or not, something I've been... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, sure whether it was hand-baited or auto-baited, yeah. sometimes uh, we use snap-on as well, some of our fisheries okay. too, so, which usually on the snap-on fisheries are baited on quite well, even double-hooked. Um, but again, it gets back to the bait, but it is something to think about. Okay, thank you. Yep, um, Megan. Jane? No? Yeah. So in uh, light of the wondering what's happening with those empty hooks, we're doing a hook accelerometer experiment to assess bycatch and it's different fish have different tug strengths on when they mm -hmm. hook and so we're assessing to see if we can differentiate that, that tug to mm -hmm. assign it to a, a certain fish if, it, if the hook comes up empty. You know, you know, the, the, it just might be an, another way to look at that issue. Who's paying for that? But the bike, no bycatch reduction program. Okay. But the taxpayers of the U.S. are paying for that. Yeah. Uh, when I was at the last Colto meeting in uh, Tasmania, um, one of the gentlemen down there, this was not during the meeting, but uh, in the, the evening, mentioned a hook timer, and this is more for your information, if some of you might have heard of it, but uh, I've done some investigation and uh, found a, a French company uh, selling this product, and uh, I find it very interesting because it will actually record when the fish bites uh, the line or the hook mm. and start counting the hours it's been on. And yeah, it's just something that I wanted everyone to be aware of that this product exists. It's expensive, mm. but uh, yeah, keep it in mind. Mm. Well, my understanding is that you know there's even mechanical hook timers existed. You know, if you look at some of the fishery science um, articles from back in the 50s and 60s, uh, that technology's been around for a while. But yeah, electronic ones obviously would be pretty cool too, but yeah. Very useful for working out, you know, what is it an appropriate soak time, because you can see when, once the fish stop biting, you know, you're just wasting time having the, the gear on the bottom. So, for example, in, so, the Kegelin fishery, similar to ours, uh, at Heard Island, you know, the main bycatch is grenadier, so you've got a, an easy, single species that you can count to, to use the, the Gasco method, as it's been called today, um, to work out this sort of thing. I mean, are the other fisheries, so is that something that would be amenable to, to Alaska or, or the Falklands or, or Chile or that sort of thing? Andres? Uh, I read that paper by uh, Nicola Gasco et al, and I actually tried that, and it does not work for us. Okay. For the same reasons that simply uh, comparing, making proximate comparisons doesn't work. Mm. We don't have enough consistency in the data coming from just one vessel at a time. Yeah, yeah. So we can't use that either. Mm. Jen? Could you just repeat the question, please? So what's the composition of bycatch that you get in the sablefish fishery? And is it, you know, so would you be able to use the ratio between a depredated line and a non-depredated line to estimate something like um, we do with the two fish? We see grenadier, that's probably the biggest component. That is, mm -hmm. uh, there's a few rock fishes and some things, but sometimes the grenadier seems like they're a little more pelagic. So again, okay. if your line didn't quite get all the way to the bottom and you're seeing you know, grenadier, it's, it's, it's a little tougher that way. Um, 
the, I think the giant grenadiers are mostly what we, uh, the biggest portion of the biomass in those depths. So, yeah, I think it's a little difficult. We make assumptions as fishermen all the time to try to explain things. Um, when you're trying to get scientific about it, I think it'd be pretty tough to draw any conclusions with that one. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, to to expand on what Jeff's saying, I think um, we, you know we read it as well, and from the stock assessment purposes. But then this, the assumption that that ratio should be static uh, is a big would be a big issue for mm -hmm. us spatially, and so yep. that that's that you know there's a lot of it, it's a, it could be a, a very valuable validation method or something mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, but the assumptions of the static relationship, I think, would be difficult for us to bring in. Okay. Has anyone else got anything they want to ask? Have we got any of our uh, Chilean colleagues that would like to ask a question? Oh, Paul, yep. Um, I um, just wanted to point out uh, something I've been hearing over the, the past two days. Uh, to my point of view, there are uh, two approaches of incorporating uh, depredation into the uh, stock assessment. Uh, just to give you an example, when we uh, produced the uh, first uh, depredation estimates, uh, that was back in 2008-2009, uh, uh, um, then the uh, reaction of uh, the National Museum of History taking care of the uh, uh, quotas were to uh, reduce the quota of uh, the Crozet Island because they were um, assuming that uh, depredation, I mean, what was taken by the whales was actually, yeah, fished, captured, uh, but not accounted. So they applied some kind of uh, uh, princip um, principle of uh, uh, precaution uh, to, uh, to, to, to that issue. A uh, second approach might be to uh, uh, consider that uh, depredation decrease, uh, decreases your cash rate. Uh, so if you include depredation, uh, you may have actually a better cash rate, which may give you proxy of maybe a better stock condition. Um, so I just wanted to have your thoughts about that because those are two, two different approaches and they have great implication into the quota uh, allocation processes. Well, I mean, my view, as you saw in my talk, is you shouldn't use CPUE if you can avoid it. Um, but yeah, it is quite compelling. You know, people love using it. Um, so if you can get some sort of independent uh, index of abundance like Tagra captures, then I think that's probably the better thing to do. So you estimate the, or you impute um, how much depredation has occurred. You include that as part of the removals, and then you, um, but then you use your uh, tag recaptures as your index of abundance rather than sort of trying to tune it using your CPUE to sort of say, well, is it more productive or less productive based on that? Because, yeah, it's, if, if there's a lot of um, uncertainty in exactly how much depredation is going on, um, it, it makes it pretty difficult to come up with a, uh, a robust method to incorporate uh, that stuff into your stock assessment. I mean, I'm a fan of the precautionary approach, um, but it does go to that point, you know. If, if those fish were going to die anyway, whether the fishery was there or not, then it kind of doesn't really make that much sense to, to lower the TAC. There may have been other reasons why the TAC was lowered as well. I mean, Crozet got smashed by illegals. Um, so, yeah, a little bit of nervousness about allowing that fishery to expand dramatically, given its history. Uh, yes, one thing that we're going to start doing is uh, you, our stock assessments with a model that optimizes natural mortality within the model. Mm. So if you infer depredation, maybe it'll simply shift that away from natural mortality. And if you don't infer the depredation level, it'll charge it off as natural mortality. Mm. So we're, we're going to start looking at how much of a difference that makes, but maybe it's simply a difference of which type of mar natural, of which type of mortality you label it as, mm. but not that it's absent one way or the other. Mm. Yeah, that appeals, but the problem with stock assessments is they are so sensitive to natural mortality that you can get quite um, spurious results. But uh, 
yeah, I think it's a, a definitely worthwhile attempting. Martha? Thanks. Um, I think you, you picked up one of the points that I wanted to make. Stock assessment, it, you know, we tried to present it very simple here, but it's actually quite complicated. Um, and it really depends on how you look at this type of mortality. And um, you know, using it as a fishing mortality it might be a bit more realistic in incorporating it into stock assessment. If you use it as a natural mortality, like you said, you know, there's this issue of being quite sensitive to it. Um, so it can, whichever way you look at it, it can be a case where you think it's going to increase your catches or you think it's going to decrease your catches. The point is that it will, in any case, increase your uncertainty if you don't include it. So this is my opinion. Um, in my opinion, you should include it where you can because that gives you a better estimate what will happen with your stock in the future. Um, even, if it doesn't, even if you think it doesn't have a big impact, um, I think it's worth including it just so you know that this component of mortality is um, used or um, accounted for. Yeah, I mean, then, then the challenge becomes is how do you predict what it's likely to be? So when you're projecting the stock forward, do you assume that it's going to get worse or better? Or, you know, that's, that's pretty tricky too. Andrea, did you have well, uh, I could just add that uh, whether or not it increases your uncertainty, uncertainty depends to some extent on whether your depredation estimate itself is certain or not. So certainly um, it's worth trying one way or the other and then just looking at what kind of variability distributions you get. I'm not a science, science people, so I, I just uh, like, would like to make the comment that uh, we feel here that if if the um, stock assessment is based purely in CPUE, as it is the case here in Chile, mm. then uh, the the predation must be taken into account because obviously the CPUE, which is your basic information, is affected mm. by the predation. So if uh, if that is the case, I don't understand the formulas you use and the models, but. <laughs> If your basic information is is uh, affected, mm. then of course you have to uh, somehow reflect it into the stock assessment, and at the end of the day, in the in the quarter location, because it's it's um, the abundance should be more than what you you are using in your model. Mm. May, maybe I'm saying nonsense, but <laughs> no, 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 well, the, the, that's correct. Um, but I guess that's. I guess in the longer in the longer term, I would advise that you move away from a CPUE, purely CPUE based modelling framework. So, <laughs> um, because, yeah, CPUE is very very difficult to understand um, exactly what influences it. When CPUE goes down, it almost certainly means the stock is in trouble. If it goes up, it could be that it's better technology or. Um, availability's changed, or you know, there's all all lot, sorts of different reasons why um, CPUE varies, and it's um, it's very very tricky to, to use in a robust way. So I, you know, my suggestion is I agree with you. I think if the current model is going to continue to use CPUE, depredation should be taken into account. But I also think in the longer run, you should be trying to move away from a purely CPUE based stock assessment if that's possible. Yeah, Megan. working with the commercial fishery data a lot lately is this hyper stability that you're going to mm. see. So fishing effort increases and, and you are likely to miss an initial decline in your stock. Mm. Depredation could exacerbate that at some level and then you've got a bunch of sort of factors spinning and, and it sets up a risky recipe if the stock is in trouble but your fishing sort of efforts and your technology has improved you don't catch it, um, and that's you know one of the. Uh, but I mean, it's surveys are expensive, tag programs are expensive, and it's, so it's um, figuring out how to account for that. But that's you know, in in including including commercial fishery data is just is tricky. But I you know yeah, depredation absolutely has an impact on your results. So it's just yeah, just another a thought uh, that this hyper stability that Dirk was talking about is a real issue. So, so how is fisheries research funded in, in Chile? Like, are you, are you levied? Is the industry levied directly, or do you just pay taxes and then? Uh, 
What's, how does it work? I don't know. I, I, maybe Daria Rivas from uh, Subsecretaria Pesca can help us on that issue. I don't, I don't know the answer. Mm. We pay a lot of money on license and we don't see that money used, being used in, <laughs> in the investigation. Or yeah, sure. Well, thank you. It's on? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, it's, uh, it's a pity to say that uh, we are uh, in an age of uh, budget restrictions. So, as you can imagine, we are going down in, in, in a um, availability of uh, budget to, to pay this kind of uh, research. But uh, also, we are moving backwards in terms of uh, regulations and uh, unfortunately our recently modified Fisheries Act doesn't uh, allow us to um, improve or at least to, to uh, encourage collaborative research, which is needed because, of course, you have uh, a, a very scarce uh, budget. Um, most of the, this research uh, needs to be on a very expensive uh, vessels. Mm. Our research vessels are very costly, so around $30,000 uh, per day. Mm. It's very expensive for, mm -hmm. for uh, in our uh, current conditions. And um, so uh, one of the things that uh, we have learned here, and well, a lot of time we have uh, looking uh, that in another countries uh, they have solved by means of uh, uh, adequate procedures and in terms of the uh, private sector and public sector uh, procedures to uh, avoid uh, 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 Inf bad influences uh, yep. from the private sector mm. uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, losing track of, of that uh, in, uh, low improvements and uh, uh, we have uh, currently um, many problems to uh, uh, support that kind of uh, collaborative research. Mm. Nevertheless, uh, we have some little uh, budget in, in terms of the Chilean fish, uh, Chilean sea bass, uh, mainly focused in uh, tag and recovery. Mm. That's our main effort uh, currently. Um, Mm, but uh, the other side of the thing is that uh, our scientists, particularly from our uh, main uh, scientific advice agency, they need to understand the efforts that have been made the last seven years, more or less, in order to use that information which is related with, of course, the predation, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, in, in uh, our uh, uh, abundance index, mainly based in CPUA as usual, commercial CPUA, uh, in, in which um, uh, some scientists from CEPES has been working uh, in a comparison uh, between the, 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 the old-fashioned long lines, I mean, Spaniard, as, as you say, and uh, uh, our uh, umbrella system, which has changes around 2006, 2007, more than this. And uh, we lost uh, 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 the former uh, CPUA series. Mm -hmm. And we have a new that you cannot wait. Mm -hmm. And the predation effect mm -hmm. in between. 
So, well, as I don't want to be, uh, bother you with, with that kind of problems, but uh, we are trying to deal with this uh, kind of things, uh, but it's very hard to do uh, here mm. currently. Sure. Unfortunately. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can't change the uh, Chilean government or the, or the or your Fisheries Act. <laughs> I <Both>. guess, <laughs> but I guess the, the the thing that we can conclude from this symposium, well, I think, is that um, the most effective way to address these issues is to have close collaborations between all of the people that are involved. Um, you know, we see the Sea Swap program. That's you know, we've got industry and scientists travelling together. Um, I mean, Jan and Megan, I, I don't know, maybe you're corrupted by um, hanging around with, with Jeff, but you don't seem to be too corrupt. Um, uh, you know, um, Paul and Nico have been out on fishing boats and, you know, they don't seem to be too corrupt. Um, I spent some time talking to Reese in the airport lounge on the way here and I hope that I haven't been too influenced by that. I'm sure he tried, but so... You know, Marta the same. Um, so I, I think um, a message from this symposium that we can send is that uh, the best way to address these issues is to get scientists and industry and government together in the, room, the same room. And at least if they can agree that they're agreed to what the problem is, um, then you can start to um, work together to, to resolve it. So um, I, I wish you luck, I guess. Um, but I think that's the way that it's going to get solved. <clears throat> Can I just say something? Sure. Well, just on that subject, I mean, the Falkland Islands, we're a tiny place, 3,000 people, and we've got four industries, so you can imagine the fisheries department is stretched at the best of times. The toothfish fishery is very, obviously very important, and it's significant in the economy of the islands, but it's one of the many, many fisheries that the fisheries department has to contend with and how many are you at the fisheries department not many anyway <laughs> <laughs> 10 uh, and trying to cope with everything and so i mean it has been the case for several years that as industry we've accepted that if we need more resource than the fisheries department can cope with and then we're going to have to contribute to it um, and we do um, we currently pay for 50% of one toothfish scientist post, which is just looking really at the biology of the fish. And we'll now also be contributing um, to further science. Um, and that is because we need that science, we want, we want that resource allocated to it, and we have to pay for it. Of obviously, in, in arranging that, we, we have an agreement, an MOUs, to, to agree what is actually the purpose of it and what's going to come out of it. We don't then have any influence. We're not the paymasters. We um, we're, not, we're not the line managers. Um, so there is a separation there. And um, I think it works perfectly well. And I'm sure, you know, I don't think anyone in the Falklands objects to that, that system. And it's all in, out in the open. I mean, you know, I'm sure if the public wanted to know the details of that arrangement, they would be able to find that out. And, you know, so, all right. Um, well, just a, sorry, just I wanted to add yes. one thing. Uh, I think we, we are doing the same thing here. We have to. to we took like like company and industry were taking that responsibility. The problem is that after we do that effort, the the state or the or the authorities don't take in account what we have just done, and that's the problem. So, for example, I was just talking with one of you. Uh, for, uh, for us, it's very important that when we find a method, it stays, and, uh, for example, the Colto Punta Arenas 2016, so we can quote it. And scientists work based on other work, and they're always quoting it. So when it's, and it is validated from the scientist point of view. So when, if we have a, a um, a new method here that has been uh, agreed with all of us and then published, that will be a very important tool for us uh, because scientists will be able to use it. So, for example, I can tell you that my father has a great statics of all our fisheries, our, our industry for the last 10 years. All that information cannot be used. Cannot be used. And that's awful. So that's the only way to validate those data 
is through a published to, to be published somewhere. So that's maybe we can publish something from the conclusion we have here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's, I mean, possibly um, tomorrow when we have the more open discussion, I think it'd be really useful to talk about, um, you know, touch on that. How do you get credibility, you know, scientific credibility for the, for the work you're doing? Because I, I think that's, it's a challenge. I mean, getting it published, I don't think it's enough even. I mean, there's a lot of junk in the literature, I've got to, <laughs> got to tell you, there's stuff that you can cite that'll support any, any idea, but um, I think um, that might be something we can talk about a little bit more tomorrow, because I think it's a really important issue for everybody. Um, we're, we've run out of time. Um, we need to go and have our uh, lunch. So try and remember whether you ordered the salmon or the pork pasta <laughs> um, or the nothing. I think there was a, some people didn't order anything, so um, enjoy the salad buffet. Um, but yeah, thanks very much, and we'll see you after lunch.